Okay, uh, so I want to thank you all of you guys for joining us today. Um, I'm Rachel and this is Matt and our program is Ironwood Wolves and we are going to talk to you guys about wolves today and their importance in the ecosystem and then at the end we're going to introduce our newest ambassador animal, Emma, who's our 11 week old Arctic puppy. So first we're going to talk about us and a little of what we do. If I can get this to, to move. Here we go. So we are a small wildlife educational facility. We started out in 2013 with one animal and we've just kind of grown from there through the years. Our main objective is to take our animals out in public for you guys to meet them up close and personal. And hopefully from there you'll learn to uh, respect and love the species even more than you did before. So that's the whole purpose of our ambassador program is education through positive experiences with our animals. So we do, on a normal, you know, circumstance, we are out in, you know, libraries and schools and doing different presentations. And then also we do interactive things where people can meet the animals and take pictures with them and that kind of stuff too. So here's some pictures of us do out doing programs and things like that. So the whole thing with ambassador animals is when you meet them, you, you know, again, will have a better appreciation for their species just by interacting with them or seeing them up close and personal. So ambassador animals have a very important role. There's all kinds of different species or of ambassador animals. So like if you go to the zoo, any animal like that that's interacting with anybody is considered to be an ambassador. So we do um, that kind of stuff. And then of course, like the fine art photography and things like that too, which believe it or not is enrichment for the animals. So they get to go out in the public eye and or different locations and different sights and smells and they get asked to do certain behaviors or poses. So it's fun for them too. And again, this is how people find out about our program when these kind of photos get published like in you know, magazines or articles and things like that. So we are currently home to four ambassador wolves in our program. You can see little Emma there. And then we have across from her and Lucian and the bottom two are younger boys, Luther and Logan. None of our guys come from the wild. They are bred for what they do. So if you've seen any TV show or movie, the most popular reference we always make, of course, is Game of Thrones. All these animals are bred for what they do, and um, a lot of them are related to each other. So it's a small industry. We all know each other, so it's pretty cool that you know to see some of our animals' relatives, like on movies and things like that. So, um, so our animals are again their official title would be a working ambassador animal. So it's no different than any other dog that has a job. So service dogs, police dogs, all those kinds of dogs you know, jobs for those dogs. They were bred for that and trained for that specifically. And it's the same thing with our guys too. So Emma is 11 weeks old and we are out doing as, as best as we can right now with the COVID situation, socializing her. So she's going to a lot of different stores with us and things like that. So she can hear all the kinds of noises and meet all kinds of different people. So as an adult, she's hopefully comfortable to do all the things with us that she's gonna do in her career as an ambassador animal. So there are programs like us all over the country that are doing this, uh, uh, you know, either the educational work or, you know, the outreach stuff, the events where you can interact with the animals. And we all have the same goal is to get people to see these animals as we do and to, you know, have a better appreciation for them. But still, we run into a lot of people who are afraid of wolves or don't understand them. And all this is just based on things that we're taught when we're young, like all the stories and things and myths and fairy tales, of course, Little Red Riding Hood is the biggest one that comes to people's mind. You know, you we are taught the wolf is the big bad wolf, we need to be afraid of them, that they're scary, all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're trying to do today and at every day doing events and programs is kind of tackle those myths associated with wolves. So by nature, wolves are very shy. They rarely approach people. They'd rather be left alone. They are a flight animal, so if something scares them, they run away. And that's always the biggest thing that we have to teach people in the hardest part of raising a, one of these guys as a puppy is desensitizing them to people and riding in the car or even walking outside and listening to traffic, cars 
you know, car horns, anything you can think of, they are afraid of. So we have to desensitize them for that so that we can show that you guys, that they are not scary. So they are way more afraid of the world and us than we are of them. So, I don't know what's happening to the screen. Okay. In the wild, wolves live in a family structure and they rely on one another to survive. So, the wolf pack is similar structure to a human family. So, there's mom and dad and there's the babies and maybe sometimes other relatives that are part of the pack or family. So, there is no alpha wolf or, you know, animal like that in charge that is aggressive to the others. They all work together as a family unit and take care of one another and the mom and dad make the rules just like in a human family. So the alpha term actually came from a study done in the 70s where a bunch of male animals were put together to see how they interacted with one another. And that's where that incorrect assumption came from by watching those male animals fight with each other. So now we know that that's not accurate. And instead of saying alpha, um, most biologists now are saying breeding male and breeding female for mom and dad. So, but as some animals in the pack age, uh, dynamics and rankings can change. So like some of them can be more bossy than others, but it's always the responsibility of the parents to keep order. Just the same as with the human family, sometimes siblings are gonna fight with each other, that sort of thing. There's gonna be, you know, things like that that happen uh, within the family unit, but it's always the parents' uh, responsibility to keep order in the family. <laughs> So I don't know what's happening, scribbling all over my screen here. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Um, here in North America, we are home to two species of wolves in North America. We have the gray wolf and the red wolf. Uh, the gray wolf is what you're gonna think of when you think of a wolf species. Uh, when you go to the Columbus Zoo, for example, the wolves there, those are the Mexican wolves. That is a subspecies or type of gray wolf, and that is all the kinds that we house as well. All of our guys are different types or uh, subspecies of gray wolf. Uh, the red wolf is a highly endangered species in North America. There's uh, less than 12 left in the wild, and there's about 200 in captivity. So that is all you know, that we have left of that species. And with things happening right now with, you know, their conservation, we might unfortunately see them go extinct in the wild if things do not improve. Um, as far as the, the gray wolf subspecies in North America, we had over 20 different subspecies, and now we only have five left. And that is all based on hunting or human intervention, pushing them out of their natural habitat, that kind of stuff. And it's all just because People are so afraid of them that we have eradicated them from, you know, all of, almost all of their natural habitat. They're only present now in about 20% of their historical range. Um, and that includes they had been eradicated from Ohio. They were here and they've been gone since the mid-1800s and they are not coming back. Um, but we did have wolves in Ohio at one point as well. And just here's more uh, information on the red wolf. So the only ones that are left in the wild live at the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. And it's a very small area where they are found. And that's the only place where they're protected just within that place. Um, there's been efforts to release them in Tennessee, but that didn't work out very well. They were just hunted very quickly by people. So again, it's all just based on fear of wolves and not understanding them is the reason why. Um, the red wolf and you know the gray wolf as well have been eliminated from most of their historic range. So here is the historic and current range of the gray wolf in North America. The red or the dark or orange coloring is where they're found now and then the light orange is where they used to be. So you can see down there in Arizona and New Mexico, that's the only place that we find the uh, Mexican wolf subspecies, and those are the ones that you'll find at the Columbus Zoo. There's uh, less than 200 of that subspecies left in the wild, and places like the zoo here are part of the breeding program to kind of help with the conservation efforts of that subspecies. The other subspecies kind of move and migrate around up in northern, uh, out, like out west in, in Canada and things like that, and they, a lot of the subspecies will interbreed with each other because of that, so that can blur the lines also between, you know, how the different subspecies look at the different types. 
So this is again just a little summary of how few wolves we have. Uh, Alaska is considered to be the only place that has a healthy wolf population. So if you think of, especially out west, how many thousands of like grizzly bear and um, mountain lions and stuff exist. If you look at how many wolves we have, that's really not very many. But for some reason, this you know people think that this. A lot of people that don't like wolves think these numbers are acceptable, and it's simply just because they're afraid of them or just don't like them. And the 12 in North Carolina there is representative of the red wolf, but I think that has gone down to 10 in the last month or two. So we like to show this as a comparison too, because we get a lot of people that to where they've seen a wolf in their backyard. Uh, so the top two photos are a gray wolf and the bottom two are a coyote. Now coyotes moved out this way and have been in Ohio since uh, I think it was 1920 was the first time coyotes were seen in Ohio. And they migrated out this way because, or 1919, sorry, they, they migrated out this way because there was no wolves here. In the places where wolves and coyotes lived, Together, wolves will kind of control the coyote numbers or keep them out of their territory. But since we have no wolves here, coyotes are coming here and kind of fill, trying to fill that um, place in the ecosystem. Even though you know they eat a lot smaller animals, they are here now because we eliminated wolves. But that is the main difference between the two physically. You can see the coyote is a lot smaller. They have bigger ears, smaller pointy faces, and because they're a desert animal, so they're built for heat. So they're not as big or as thickly furred as the wolf. And then, <coughs> excuse me, our coyote here is also no known as the Eastern coyote. Another term that we hear is the koi wolf. Um, we don't like to use this term personally because we find it scares people. They hear koi wolf and they think it's this aggressive coyote wolf creature that's going to come and, you know, it hurt you because it's part wolf and it's dangerous, but the truth is is that for the most part our coyotes here, they some of them do have wolf lineage because of as they were migrating, some of them did interbreed with wolves, but more recently they have domestic dog in their lineage. So this is contributing to maybe the different color more. So you can see this coyote here looks very different from you know the western counterpart. And this could also maybe be contributing to the fearlessness of people because they have recent dogs in them too. Either way, these animals are still considered to be a coyote by biologists. So they're using the term Eastern coyote. It's probably gonna be considered a subspecies of the Western coyote at some point. We'll see what happens with the taxonomy of that. But right now, this is um, what we call them as the Eastern coyote. So don't be afraid and try not to use the quill term because it is a little misleading too. So we learned a lot about how important wolves are in the ecosystem when they are returned to Yellowstone National Park. So if you see on one side to the other, it kind of shows how the park looked before wolves were there and after they were reintroduced in the early to mid 90s. And what you see without wolves, we have a lot of elk and deer and not a lot of grass. On the other side with the wolves, we have all the elk and deer still there, there's just fewer of them, and they're moving around the park, and we have the biggest change would be all the plant life, the shrubbery, the grasses, all that stuff grew back because the wolves were controlling the numbers of the ungulates, which are the deer, moose, and elk, and the bison as well in the park, and that was letting all of the grasses and things recover and all the tree life grow back, and this was also bringing in other animal species that rely on those places to live and have their own offspring and that kind of stuff. So just even the way that the landscape looked changed dramatically by bringing the wolves back as the apex predator in the habitat where they belonged. They had been gone for several decades after um, they had been finally returned. So we saw a lot of positive changes in the park and also just the amount of tourism brought to the area for people just coming to hope to get a glimpse of a wolf has made a big difference um, economically as well. <clears throat> so most people think that wolves weigh hundreds of pounds where actually um, depending on the subspecies they can be as small as 50 pounds or maybe in the high 90s or 110 pounds which is considered to be really large 
Uh, they can stand on average between 26 and 36 inches tall at the shoulder. You can see this picture of Luther's paw here in Matt's hand. You can see how big their paws are. They have really long toes. This helps with traction on ice and snow. Their eye color is never blue. They can be brown, amber, or even a pale green. And in the wild, wolves typically only live about three to six years. It takes them two years to be fully mature or adults, and that's when they're able to breed as their second year. In captivity, they can easily live 12 to 15 years. <clears throat> and of course, gray wolves come in three different colors, black, gray, and white. The Arctic subspecies is typically almost always all white, and then we can see all three colors and the other subspecies of gray wolf as well, even in the same pack or family. And another thing is wolves go through a big change through the seasons with their coat. So this shows the difference between the summer and the winter coat. They go through this when they molt in the springtime, and this is what the spring molt looks like. So if you see this again with animals at the zoo, this is normal, there's nothing wrong with them. This is just part of how they shed or move their coat and it comes off differently than a dog. You can see it peels off in big layers. And then once they, it's all gone, then they're in their nice summer coat and they feel a lot different in the warmer months. So right now all of our adults feel really wiry. And then in the winter time when they get that thick coat, uh, they feel very soft, and that is controlled not only by temperature, but mostly by daylight. So when the daylight starts to get longer or shorter, that will activate whether they're going to keep that undercoat or shed it out. And we also like to show this difference between the wolf and some commonly mistaken as wolf dog breeds. So we have the husky up top next to the wolf, then the German shepherd, and a malamute, which is like a large sled dog as well. And these three are, again, often mistaken as being wolves, but they're not. You can see a huge difference in the way that the coat looks, the body structure, and that sort of thing. And we like to point this out because a lot of times, again, the stigma of wolves being aggressive or scary, this can carry on over to some people's dogs if people mistake them as being a wolf and then they become afraid of them. So it's important to be able to tell the difference between all those because we unfortunately see a lot of these guys go to dog shelters because they're labeled as something that they're not. So and it's just based on the fact that people are just so terrified of wolves and think that they're so aggressive and dangerous, when really all those behaviors are things that you're going to see in domestic dogs, but not wolves. Wolves are not protective. They will not chase after you, and, you know, any of that stuff. Those are all traits that we bred into dogs to help protect us and that sort of thing. So you're not going to, again, see that in a wolf. So when wolves uh, breed, they choose a mate and stay with them for life. Babies are born once a year in the spring after 63 days gestation. A uh, typical litter size is four to six puppies, not cubs, they're called pups. And every member of the family works together to take care of the baby. So this picture is actually a photo of Luther. When we brought him home, we brought him home at 11 days old and Emma who we'll bring out shortly we brought her home at 10 days and this is typical to bring them home and bottle feed them ourselves because this helps with not only her bond to us but you know this is just the way that you do this with animals that are going to be working with people you want them to be comfortable with that so if you were to leave them with mom for eight weeks they would be already feral by that point so it's pretty normal for animals like this to go to their facilities wherever they're going to go at a young age so that they can bond to people and not, you know, become feral already at a young age. So here's another picture of an adult with the puppies. So you can see that wolf pups are like a darker color. So this black one here, he's going to be black colored as an adult like mom. And then the other one is going to be either gray or white. So Emma being an Arctic type, she was not born white, she was born this brown color, and as she's aged in the last few weeks, she has gotten lighter and lighter, and she'll continue to get lighter until she turns white. So right now, she's kind of like a almondy, you know, kind of color, like a light brown, but that will change in the coming weeks, too. And this helps with camouflage, so they can't be seen by predators. So here's a better example of baby arctics, even, when they're young. So Emma looked pretty much like this when she was that age.
And another thing that's like, that wolves are like us in the way that they look. So they all look unique, just like all of us look unique. Then none of them look exactly the same. So you can even see in all these photos of wolves that are all the same color. If you look close, they all look different in their own ways. They're not all exactly the same. And a good example of that is that close-up photo of the three in the bottom corner. And they're all gray colored, but they all have different face markings. So they're probably related. So just like us, we can see similarities in facial structures and stuff with animals that are related, but they all have differences from one to the next. Uh, as far as communication goes, wolves, of course, howl, and that is their main form of communication, you know, from far away. They communicate with body language and smells and things, too, but howling is probably the most recognized and what you think of when you think of a wolf talking to each other is they howl. And wolves do not howl at the moon, but they can be more talkative when the moon is out because they're, you know, running around and playing. Wolves can hear from very far away. They howl to tell and communicate all kinds of things, like if they're happy, if they're sad, if they found food, um, you know, all kinds of different reasons. Wolves also have been documented, they howl in mourning of the loss of a pack member, you know, that kind of stuff too. So they're very intelligent and they bond closely to one another. And then here's other forms of uh, body language. So again, it's it's just, you know, body language is the same as a dog, except for it's a little bit more, we call dramatic. Uh, the top two photos I took um, at a research facility in Indiana in the last year, and both of those I was, you know, within a few feet of them, but they weren't, you know, they were playing in the, the one on the top, right, and then the one by himself, he was snarling because he wanted the other wolf to stop howling. So I wasn't, you know, nervous at all. It's just the way that they talk. They, they make a lot more noise than the dog, and that's, again, why people are so afraid is they see you know, a photo like that of him snarling and they just take it out of context for something that it is not. But if you're in there with them, you see that they're, you know, not a threat to people at all. This is just how they talk and they're way more dramatic than the dog and they're a lot easier to read than a dog as well is, is how they feel. And then of course we see a lot of like licking and, you know, affection towards each other too with them. So wolves are very affectionate animals um, with their pack members, so they care for each other deeply. Uh, wolves have 42 teeth with a jaw strength of 1500 PSI, which means they use those strong teeth and jaws to eat meat so they can chew, you know, bone and everything. So when we feed our guys too, they're eating meat as well and they will eat all of it, so bones and all, and this is just making sure that nothing goes to waste when they take down something. They're usually only successful about 20% of the time, so the other 80%, when they try to catch something, they are not successful, which means they're eating maybe once or twice a week. So all of our guys, we feed a couple pounds of meat every day, but in the wild, they, of course, would not have that luxury. So it takes a lot of effort to take down prey. So you can see there's uh, five wolves in this picture here and this big blue elk. Sometimes they will chase prey for several days to tire them out and then they'll finally take it down. But you know, sometimes they'll chase an elk like this for days and then he gets away and then they go hungry and they've wasted all those calories running. And so a lot of times wolves lifespan is cut short due to starvation or even disease or if they travel into other wolf packs, uh, you know, wolves kill each other too in that way. But a lot of it is starvation in the elements. So uh, despite seeing all of the benefits of wolves and what kind of good they do for the ecosystem, we still see a lot of, you know, things as far as um, not liking wolves, not wanting to protect them, not understanding them. Uh, there's been, you know, proposals last year to remove protections of wolves in the lower 48. We're still waiting to see what happens with that as far as the decision goes. We were supposed to know, you know, soon, but I don't know what's going to happen with that. But if this does pass, what they're going to do is put a number on wildlife, which means certain states are all going to be in charge of 
how many wolves they have or wolf management. So this little map here shows an example, uh, like the state of Michigan is only going to allow 200 wolves in their uh, wild population. Uh, Wisconsin, 350. Minnesota, 1,600. So that's just kind of um, what they're trying to do, which really isn't fair and it doesn't work for wildlife in that way, but that's what they're trying to do. So this is, you know, doing these kind of programs are going to help us get people to understand how important wolves are and that we can't put a number on wildlife and we need to find other ways to properly manage wildlife and you know encourage conservation and that kind of thing so um, so yeah that's why we do these presentations so that people can better understand wolves and hope to care about them more so um, and all that is just because we they're easy to blame we blame them for our problems as far as hunting goes with, with hunting the uh, like livestock and things, which they only account for less than 1% of, you know, cattle deaths. But unfortunately, you know, they're just an easy, you know, thing to blame as far as that kind of stuff goes. So that's what we see a lot of problems with that, especially out West. So there's all kinds of um, programs that are trying to work with farmers and find better ways to handle this. The Wood River Wolf Project is a cool one to check out on Facebook. They're constantly doing all kinds of cool things and te helping teach cattle ranchers how to keep wolves out of their property uh, safely and without hunting them or anything like that. So it's a really cool page to follow too on Facebook. Um, and this is just a quick listing and delisting history of wolves. Uh, you can see every other year we go between protecting them or removing them from um, you know, the endangered species list. And it's just kind of silly. So now we're at the point now we're starting to see everything getting delisted again. So that's what we're trying to educate people against trying to do because a lot of this is done based on misinformation with wolves and thinking that they are a huge threat to people and our livestock, which they are not statistically. Uh, wolves have only attacked humans, uh, led to a fatal attack twice in the last 100 years in the States. And so you are more likely to win the lottery or get struck by lightning than have a wolf approach you or injure you. So because of this, the future of wolves is uncertain, but we hope that by doing these programs, that we are helping with, you know, dispelling the myths regarding wolves and helping people to see them in a different light rather than the negative side of it. So we have Emma here now. Um, and of course, you guys can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're on social media. We post all the time. And then you can see Emma grow. And we have Emma with us now. So I'm going to go ahead and um, take this screen off so that hopefully you guys can see my screen better or bigger so let's see hopefully you guys can see her um so now we're just going to be open for questions so if you guys want to unmute and have any questions for us i see some people were popping up in the chat too okay so if you guys have any questions about us or Emma, we have her here with us now. I'm going to scoot in on her a little bit. And we have um, Otto. Otto. Otto yeah, I'll probably put him out because he's a little bit distracting right now. So, um, yeah, you guys, this is Emma. She's 11 weeks old. She is an Arctic type gray wolf. And she is the first uh, Arctic that we've had in our program. So she's in training. And this is her first program with us like this, like presentation. Yep. So we're doing it all virtual. So this is <laughs> different for us too. So this is her first program. So thank you guys for having us today on here. And we thought it would be a special treat to have her on here for you guys to see. So does anyone have any questions for us about our presentation or about Emma or anything about wolves in general? Uh, sure. What is Emma's favorite food so far? Like, what's she really liking? Uh, so far, she hasn't had a lot of like different things, but she really does like the meat. So, what we're doing. Uh, they do have a particular diet. They don't do well on most dog foods or anything like that. So Emma is still raw fed, 
And what she's getting now is a pre-made raw that's got basically the protein, the bone, the organ, and everything else, and vitamins that a growing puppy needs. And it comes kind of like a ground hamburger uh, consistency. And she eats about 30 ounces of that a day. So in the wild, the mom and dad would bring meat to them. They would chew it up and kind of like throw it up <laughs> for them. So it's kind of gross, but that's how they would make sure that everything is, you know, consistent with how they can eat it being so small. You don't want them to hurt themselves trying to eat big pieces of meat or bone. So right now she's eating the ground, but as she gets older, she'll start eating bigger pieces of like venison and chicken and things like that. And if you guys don't have a mic, you can type in the chat too. I have that up. So if you guys have any questions, uh, you can type on there too, if nobody, for some of you that don't have a mic. And we can hang out here for a couple more minutes to see if anybody yep. has any questions. And then I think I'll stop the recording of the presentation. We'd also like to, again, thank everyone for basically tuning in and watching and supporting not only us, but the library and every other basically program like this right now that's trying to adapt and to the different basically uh, way that we're doing things remotely. And hopefully we'll all be back uh, in person um, first of the year. <laughs> when will she be two? She will be two. Um, well, she is only 11 weeks old, so she'll be two two years from now. Oh, that's good. But her birth is May 9th, so she'll be two May 9th, uh, 2022. Yep. And that's when she'll be considered an adult. Yep. Okay, that's crazy. <laughs> about how big do you think Emma's going to be full grown do you think she'll be like as big as Luther or your your other wolves or a little bit um, smaller hello. Yeah, the, Arctic, the Arctic subspecies hello. hello the Arctic subspecies tends to get a little bit bigger but hello. we don't imagine to weigh a lot they tend to have like a thicker bone structure but we imagine she'll be somewhere between 80 and 90 pounds. So. She'll probably be about moving height, but I imagine she'll be longer. Oh, I just know I was impressed with this program. I hope my grandson likes it. Thank you for coming, and hopefully your grandson does like it. Oh, you dropped your toy. Yeah, she gets back into this. And for those of you that do want the chance to meet Emma in person, we are doing some in-person meet and greets with small groups outside. Um, those events can be found on our Facebook events page. And we're doing those uh, kids as young as six can join us. And this is helping us socialize her and then giving people a chance to, you know, meet Emma up close and personal and learn more about her in that way too. So if anybody is interested in that, thanks have that on our Facebook uh, or if you have any questions you can email us or you know message us on social media There we go. <laughs> well, and just less of a question and more just a general library announcement. Um, the summer reading program is still going on, so if anybody wants to hop onto the Read Squared program and get some reading logged, our raffles for the prizes will be having or will be happening August seventh, and people will be notified of whether or not they won on August tenth. So there's still time to get your like reading in, reading logged. And maybe win some prizes. The thingy bite. Wait, 
All right, well, if no one else has any other questions, we're going to go ahead and log off here. But we want to thank everyone again for tuning in and basically watching us. Basically, she's trying to basically uh, grab the handle on the table. So, yeah, thank you guys all for joining us today, and hopefully um, we'll see you more in person in the next year or so. If not, uh, we're doing small events in public, so like little meet and greets and things with Emma. So, again, if you guys have any questions, you can contact us through our website or social media. And, again, just thank you guys all for coming, and I'm going to stop the recording on this now if I can.